Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. It's the show that can't believe the fable is actually true. Yes, I know there's a difference between a rabbit and a hare. A rabbit is like an adorable Charmander. A hare is like a Charmillion who's seen some And a kangaroo is like a swole Charizard. Ooh, those, those are strong arms. Let's start with the hot takes. The WNBA All-Star Game took place this past week and there were plenty of sneaker highlights. My two fades were Arike Agumbawale rocking a fire colorway of the Nike Zoom Freak 3 on her way to getting game MVP honors and three-time three-point champ Ali Quigley putting on a show in mismatching Kyrie 7s. And she's gonna do it! She got it! She got it again, y'all! Ali Quigley, your three-time three-point champion! Only thing missing was Allie talking her Larry Bird-ish and asking who was playing for second that night. Congrats to Don Cheadle for nabbing the easiest Emmy Award nomination ever for his three-minute cameo in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I know, I forgot he was on the show too. He didn't even have to wear the War Machine suit to get the nod, amazing. He really should have shown up in the finale though to kind of sort of make up for the whole why don't the other heroes show up when crazy stuff happens problem. The nomination got people all up in their feelings for some reason. Meanwhile, I'm over here like, how do I get that job? If all he's got to do is do a few guest spots here and there in shows and movies for the next phase or so while collecting that MCU bag, psh, more power to him. Oh. And while we're on the MCU tangent, congrats, Star-Lord. You're no longer the biggest idiot after what we saw in... Nah, scratch that. He's still the biggest idiot. I can relate to shit more than Star-Lord. How the people who wrote that script didn't anticipate he would get dunked on for being a horny dumbass for three years running is beyond my comprehension. And I know we're kind of late to the party on this one, but for everybody that missed it, did you know that the winner of this year's Spelling Bee competition, Zalia Avant-Garde, is also a ball-handling prodigy? Look, I'm not saying I can't spell Antetokounmpo and spin a basketball at the same time, like I'm sure Zalia can, but if she makes it to the WNBA someday, her trash talk is gonna be epic. She's gonna be trash talking like, hey, you suck, you S-T-A-R-L-O-R-D. Scotty Pippen is now the newest gimmick Airbnb host. Starting July 22nd, you can book a stay at his Chicago home to watch the Olympics. Huh. Not sure if that's a great deal, no matter the price, if it doesn't involve Scotty hanging out and telling stories about how Michael Jordan is a bum that wouldn't have six rings without him. Like, I would pay any price to do a watch along of the entire Last Dance doc with Scotty talking over it. God dang, I think I just gave him a podcast idea. Uh, uh, and I just want to give props to Larry Smoove for showing me what New Yorkers would really do if Spider-Man were real and just hanging around the city looking for things to do. Some of them would be cool and some of them would be, you know, bonafide New Yorkers. See, this is why Spider-Man couldn't work in LA. People would just ask him for selfies and to join in on their TikTok dance videos with moves that they actually stole from black kids. Oh, and breaking news, Michael Jordan wore Travis Scott in Fragment Air, uh, him, one Lowe's. Don't believe us? Look at this picture. That's obviously Michael Jordan from behind wearing the most hyped shoe of the year. That's what passes as breaking news in the sneaker world. Surprise! The guy who has his own brand wears the shoes designed by two of his most prominent collaborators. Whew! Like, wake me up if he does a shoey like when Ty Tuivasa did it at UFC 264. Oh, and a quick card pass to doing a shoey. No offense to shoey culture, which I guess is a thing, but I'm not drinking out of a shoe, pouring milk and eating cereal out of a shoe, licking a shoe, or anything else that involves my mouth close to a shoe. So this past week, we got a closer look at baseball's young bright stars for the 2021 All-Star Game. Matter of fact, it was all the baseball people were talking about when they weren't dunking on Stephen A. Smith, which you know, he kind of deserves from time to time. Now, we shouldn't treat him like a hot seat clown machine like Skip or Whitlock or anybody like that, but maybe cutting down on the appearances on everything ESPN has to offer would be a nice change. How about we think about getting Jaden and Jacoby or maybe Katie Nolan and the rest of the highly questionable crew some more primetime spots? I don't know, just an idea. Anyways, let's talk about the face of baseball, Shoei Otani. That's right, a Japanese man who probably speaks English enough to talk it to teammates and friends, but won't do it for the media because he doesn't owe a is the biggest star in the game right now. And it's 
Fine. I would know because I live in Los Angeles, the home of the last few times a foreign-born player who didn't speak fluent English was the sport's biggest star. In the 1980s, there was Fernando Valenzuela of the Dodgers, but that was like decades before my time. My Zoomer generation wouldn't know anything about that. And then in the 90s, there was Nomo Mania. It's hard to describe what it was like unless you lived it, but Dodgers pitcher Hideo Nomo was on fire during the mid-90s. When he debuted in 1995, he was the first Japanese-born player to play in the MLB in over 30 years. His style and early success landing him a starting spot in the All-Star Game and the Rookie of the Year honors. Even Nikely quickly jumped on the Nomo bandwagon because by the following year, he had his own signature trainer, the Nike Air Max Nomo. If you're wondering, the Air Max Nomo got a retro in 2011, which means it's due for a comeback sooner rather than later. And by the way, it sure looks like Nomo knew enough English to have a short chat with Michael Jordan. Like I said, these players don't owe us anything. And before Otani, we had Mike Trout, a dude who I've interviewed during his signature cleat reveals with Nike, and I still don't know what he sounds like or if he even speaks English. I'm kidding. That's a joke. Look, not everybody can be King Griffey Jr. or Derek Jeter, American-born superstars who were just as good in interviews and commercials as they were in the game. But with the numbers Otani is putting up, all he really needs to say is scoreboard. And that should be enough. That's not to say his profile wouldn't rise even higher if he was eloquent in English on the microphone or if he had a run of commercials showing off his personality like Yao Ming or Dikembe Mutombo used to do. But it's not the requisite that Stephen A tried to bumble into. And history has shown us it wasn't necessarily in the 80s and 90s. But then, if Otani was a sneaker-free agent, Nike would have a trainer ready for him by next season. As it stands, Otani is currently signed with ASICS and I wonder if they're going to make a big push for him as his star continues to climb. We haven't really seen ASICS make a splash in the signature shoe world since like Isaiah Thomas in the late 80s. Apologies to Novak Djokovic. It would also probably help if the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim that are actually east of Pomona adjacent to Newport Beach were a better team. But then again, I don't know the ins and outs of baseball so I can't make sense of why a team that has Trout and Otani can be a last place team. But let's also talk about the other star of MLB All-Star, the game's MVP, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Jordan Brand's next big thing. The son of former Los Angeles, Angel of Anaheim, south of Irvine, I think it's next to the new Avengers campus in Disneyland, California Adventure, star Vladimir Guerrero. Vlad Jr. was formerly with Under Armour, who probably watched the All-Star game and was like, really? Oh, now you win All-Star MVP, really? Like Jeter before him and fellow superstar Mookie Betts, Vlad Jr. has been spotted wearing Air Jordan 1 and Air Jordan 10 cleats, and for the All-Star game, he wore a pair of ones for his first at-bat, which led to his first home run. Here Wow! Home run in All-Star game history, and you could have chopped that up into two. Man, the sound that bat makes? Wow. People were buzzing about Otani and Vlad Jr. all night. We might not talk about baseball all that often here on the show. It sure does seem like the sport is in good hands, though, with guys like Otani, Vlad Jr., and Fernando Tatis Jr., who we featured here on Hard Pass before. It's like the NBA's next generation with Trey, Luca, and Zion. Baseball? Well, they just need to do a better way of marketing these kids to fans. And no, this isn't the problem Stephen A. and old baseball heads like to think it is. What does this night mean to you? Oh no, Vlad Jr. doesn't want to speak English the way you want. What are we going to do? <laughs> Yao Ming got by. Ichiro got by. I'm sure they will too. It's the Heat Check where we bring you everything that's dropping this week. Let's start things off with some sneakers. Take a wild guess what they are. They are not yet officially confirmed to be dropping as of this recording, but are strongly rumored to be. Again, you won't believe what these are. The Nike Dunk Low NY versus NY on July 22nd, the Women's Nike Dunk Low Purple Pulse on July 22nd, and the Nike Dunk Low Yellow Strike on July 22nd. See what I mean? All right, let's move on to the sneakers we're pretty confident are launching this week. We have the Clot Nike Air Max One Kiss of Death on the 20th for 150, a reimagining of an infamous sample made for Kanye West's Touch the Sky Tour. The color blocking is mostly the same, but I don't think anybody is going to mistake these for the OGs. They are both very cool though, and if somebody knows somebody who knows somebody and can send a pair over here for me to unbox, I would not be mad about it. Yes, I shoot my shot occasionally here on the Heat Check because you never know who's watching. 
We have the FTC Nike SB Dunk Low on July 21st for 110. Yes, would like to shoot my shot with these ones as well. With skateboarding making its debut at the Olympics this year, assuming the Olympics are actually going to happen, this pair pays homage to Japanese bathhouses. Personally, it reminds me of the E Honda stage in Street Fighter 2, mainly because I've never been to a Japanese bathhouse. But what do I know? I'm just basing it off my experience fighting Honda in his cheesy 100 hand slap move. It was when they let him slide a little bit while doing the move in turbo hyper fighting. Then we have the Nike Kyrie 4 Low Sunrise on July 22nd for 110 and the Nike KD 14 Sunset on the 22nd for 150. The Loki and Sylvia basketball team up again with this Sunrise and Sunset pair that ties into street basketball. Most notably, KD's memorable 66 point performance at Rucker Park years ago. And yes, in this analogy, Kyrie is definitely Sylvie. KD is prime Loki. DeAndre Jordan is boastful Loki. Steve Nash is classic Loki. Blake Griffin is Kid Loki and James Harden is Gator Loki. Adidas Don issue three USA on the 23rd for 110. Yes, this would have been a lot cooler if Donovan Mitchell wasn't sitting out the Olympics due to an injury. Between this pair and the Dame 7 that Damian Lillard will be wearing in Tokyo, Adidas will be bringing some heat. We have the Reebok question though, Phillies on the 23rd for 120. A throwback to the uniforms of Philadelphia's baseball team during the 1980s. Reebok is just going down the list of Philly sports history with the questions after an Eagles colorway dropped late last year. Here's hoping they do an ECW next for all of my old school wrestling fans. We have the off-white Nike Air Zoom Tempo Next Percent on the 23rd for 260. Back in 2019, co-riders' nephews came to visit rocking off-white vapor streets thinking they would impress co-rider. Being the told that he is co writer said oh those things can't you buy those off the shelves right now now we're not saying that these new zoom tempos are like entry-level off-white nikes and anybody will be able to buy it but we're also not not saying that i swear that whole thing made sense when i wrote it we have the nike lebron 8 space jam on the 23rd for 200 this will be the space jam sneaker to own and since we're recording before the release of a new legacy i have to believe it's going to make an appearance in the movie and toon squad hype beast daffy duck is going to make a meta joke about them being cooler than the 19s i mean that's a joke we sneak in there for the hype beast crowd gotta know your audience braun we have the Air Jordan 12 Twist on the 24th for 190. The twist here is that I was shocked to see these on the sneakers app when we were going over everything dropping this week. I don't know if we all just missed it, but I had no idea this colorway was arriving and this soon. I'm not so sure about the description on sneakers implying that this is some sort of flip colorway of the Cherry 12s, especially when the Jim Red 12s exist, but I do like it in a Rising Sun 12 kind of way, even though we can't and shouldn't call those the Rising Sun 12s anymore. And then we have the pick of the week, which is the Nike LeBron 8 South Beach. This is going to be on the 21st for 200. This ended up being a very loaded week, but the South Beach hangs on as our pick of the week because of its impact on the culture, which we should all probably talk about right now. And now is a heat check on the Nike LeBron 8 South Beach Retro. 11 years later, let's focus on the word retro for a second here. You might have caught it this past week that when BR Kicks was posting their list of the top 10 sneakers of 2021 so far, this little back and forth made me go, huh. The ones came out 48 years ago. This is this year. I you want just, all 10 of these yeah, to be new models. To have came out on January 1st. That's what I'm looking for. Me, Jamal Johnson. First of all, them, them ain't new. They came out this year. Yeah, but they, I'm but saying. But they're not on the list. You but they're not retros. on the list. But they're not on the list. You don't know what that. What are you talking we about? We at number 10. You don't know where we at. New Balance don't got no retros. Yes, they do. What is it? What you all got new, new Balance, balance are retros. Okay. They stopped making okay. shoes you, in 1997. You, you, now, I get it. I shouldn't be taking that bit too seriously, but the line New Balance don't do retros when a good chunk of their business are retros and new colorways of retro models is interesting to me because it's not an original thought. When people say retros, many think exclusively of Jordans. Phone posits are never retros. Questions are never retros. 550s are never retros. Dunks are never retros. No wonder Kobe named his retros Protros. He wanted people to be able to differentiate between his new sneakers and the older models. But now we've got the South Beach LeBron 8 on the way, arguably the most popular and influential which LeBron sneaker there is, was, and maybe ever will be, and it's a retro. Just like his Zoom generations that have been dropping the past few years are retros. Just like the LeBron 3s, 4s, and 7s we've seen lately are retros. Can this retro of the South Beach 8 recapture the energy that made the original so popular? Hard for me to say, but if any shoe has the potential to bring a fan back to that time and place when the original first pair dropped, it would be the LeBron 8 South Beach. This isn't just a shoe, it's a time machine. It's hard to understate, okay, that's a lie because nothing about LeBron is understated. Think about the summer of 2010 when LeBron made his infamous decision. We didn't know it at the time because it sounded so insane, but the best player of his generation put together a TV show just to break up with it. Nike was down to portray LeBron as the bad guy too with their first commercial post decision. Should I accept my role as a villain? 
and the shoe that announced the arrival of his talents to South Beach, the preheat LeBron 8, inspired by the city and its colorful vibes, that debut colorway was meant to be a ramp up of sorts to the game shoes that LeBron would actually wear for the Miami Heat. But with the added attention caused by the decision, the audacity of the colorway and its limited nature, they ended up stealing the show. Save for a summertime exhibition or a public appearance here and there, we never actually saw LeBron wear the South Beach to an NBA game. But that didn't matter, and the fact that it didn't matter was game changing. The South Beach might be made for balling, but you didn't really see a lot of people wear them on the court. Social media was still in its baby stages at that point, but anybody who was anybody at the time proved their bona fides to their following by rocking or displaying a pair of South Beaches. I'm not going to say that these shoes birthed the hype beast, but kids line up, buy bots, pay four to five times the retail price, and make sure the world knows that they got them because they want the magic and the clout that goes with owning a shoe like the South Beach. Sneaker brands not named Nike for years following the release of the South Beach tried to make their own versions that failed to live up to the name. For every LeBron 9 Elite that were cool, there were like dozens like the Nike Air Max Bojax. Remember the Nike Air Max Bojax South Beach? I like to think Bo doesn't know that one because he might truck stick somebody at Nike HQ. There were low points for LeBron too, like the Nike LeBron 11 South Beach that were so underwhelming you could buy them for nearly 50% off a few months after they were released. But as recently as 2019, you could buy the South Beach Nike Flymit Vapor Max 3. It's been a roller coaster ride to be sure, but the South Beach has endured and now that the original is coming back, I'm going to be very interested to see if it will strike again like it did in 2010. Will this retro be for LeBron what Chicago's and Royals and Concords are for Michael Jordan and Jordan brand? If the lines we've been seeing for the early release at Unknown Miami or anything to go by, then maybe there is something there. Some people are looking to re-up while others are getting them for the first time. I know there's going to be plenty of hate and claims that people are just buying them up to resale, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of kids and adults who were kids a decade ago rock them these next few months. And that's what retros should be doing, Jordans or not. I give the Nike LeBron 8 South Beach Retro 8 Miami number 6 jerseys out of 10 button-up decision shirts. Man, there's no way Braun would wear that shirt with those jeans today. It would be like his Fortnite skin with a jacket, hoodie, and shorts combo and a pair of ambush dunks today, probably. It's time for this week's Hard Pass, where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go. Like paying $1.56 million for a video game. Yeah. That's not fair. 1.56 million for a sealed copy of a super common video game. No matter what condition it is in, is not a part of the culture. You've probably heard about it in the news, but a heritage auction listing for Super Mario 64, arguably the most influential video game of the last 25 years, sold for that super high number. However, there's a difference between your loose cartridge of Mario 64 collecting dust in a storage unit somewhere in Temecula and the one that sold for big bucks. For starters, it's sealed in its original packaging, meaning the cartridge has never seen the light, the corners of the box are sharp, and the shrink wrap around the box is immaculate. Then it was deemed pristine by WADA, a company that grades the condition of the packaging and seals the game in Lucite. In this case, the Super Mario 64 box got a grade of 9.8, a high number for sure, and certainly an uncommon grade, but the common nature of Super Mario 64 is what makes that sale price puzzling. Just look at eBay and you won't find a shortage of Super Mario 64 carts in any condition. From broken to barely used to complete with box to sealed, you can find it there. Yes, the 9.8 is a superb grade and it's bragging rights, I guess, but according to Heritage, it's not the only known 9.8. In fact, there are currently around five known copies of Mario 64 with that grade. If I had hit it big during the peak of GameStop or AMC meme stock rush or whatever and I had f it money, I would not spend 1.56 million on something that four other people also have. Not only that, with how common that game is, I would not be surprised to hear a story of an employee at a Target or Walmart warehouse discovering unopened cases of this game and they could all be grade 9.0 or higher. It's not that video games haven't been selling for exorbitant amounts lately, like a Legend of Zelda for the original NES with a 9.0 grade sold for 870,000, but unlike the Mario 64, this was a rare variant that featured packaging that was not found in more common versions of the game. 
So even though that amount is shocking, the rarity of the box made it a little more easier for me to understand, as crazy as that sounds. And in April, an equally obscure version of the original Super Mario Brothers with different packaging sold for 660,000. So yes, there is money to be made if you happen to be a kid who for some reason forgot to open their copy of Contra, which FYI, a 9.0 graded version of that game, recently sold for close to $1,500 on eBay. A 9.8 copy of Pokemon Emerald for the Game Boy Advance sold for 40,000. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas for PS2 graded 9.8 was worth 10,000. It's a lot to take in really. It's the next asset class or whatever fancy term Bloomberg or the Wall Street Journal likes to use. Basically, for everyone collector out there who just loves the hunt for these games to have and to hold and to cherish, there might be dozens of stock market bros right now buying all of these games and cards and comics in hopes that they will appreciate in value and sell them for stupid amounts later. Maybe not Mario 64 stupid, but numbers getting close to that. Like, I can mostly understand it with trading cards and comic books because you're buying what's featured on the card and the comic book. With the video game, you're paying for the cardboard surrounding the video game. It would be the equivalent of paying a million bucks for a dead stock pair of Chicago ones from 1985 that was sealed in a glass case and was never opened. The box was perfect with sharp corners. The label was pristine with no signs of wear and there were no imperfections like sticker prices or for sale labels. The shoe could be crumbling inside, but you would never know it. Look, I don't wanna immediately jump to the conclusion that this is all just some big money laundering scam because I think there really is something to be said about owning the most pristine version of a thing. Coin collectors have been doing that for decades before we started slabbing our cards and comics, but games just hit different, I guess. Like, there's no shortage of ways for me to play Super Mario 64 on various Nintendo platforms. Don't get me wrong, the box was an important part of the package, and in no way am I advocating for the EB Games employees who sold the game to crush the box in front of me like it was a pair of ambush dunks. Let me keep the box and let me do with it as I please. Now, if Nintendo had pulled a Wu-Tang Clan and sold just one copy of Super Mario 64 Part 2, which was allegedly in development in the late 90s, I can understand buying that for 1.56 million. But then again, if I did that with my AMC money, I would have found a way to copy it and distribute it online so everyone could enjoy it, not like the farmer bro idiot who eventually lost the Wu-Tang album to the feds and is now sitting somewhere in an undisclosed location like it's Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, and if somebody's interested in the very used copy of the collector's edition of The Legend of Zelda, Zelda Ocarina of Time, yes, the gold cartridge, with a finished save file titled DX69 for half a million dollars, let co writer know. He even accepts best offers. And that's gonna do it for the show today. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am Jacques Slade. I'll see you next week, but not before I show you the smartest way to avoid those West Coast Joe Hoarded White Air Force Ones. Just paint over your old ones. Dead. <laughs> Peace.